Good morning. I'm Dr. Indithi, Associate Professor, Department of Pathology. So, topic for today's session is granulomatous lesion of skin. So, the lesson plan will be uh, granulomas, which are categorized as epithelioid, foreign body, and microbiotic. We'll be looking into each of one of it. Now, coming to epithelioid granulomas, they are categorized as non necrotizing and necrotizing. So, non-necrotizing examples are sarcoidosis, granulomatous UCA, and leprosy. Whereas, necrotizing, we have primary tuberculosis, miliary tuberculosis, lupus vulgaris, then scopholoderma, tuberculosis, cutis, or syphilis, then tuberculates, then fungal infection, tertiary syphilis, lupus vulgaris. All these fall into necrotizing epithelial granulomas. Now coming to foreign body type of uh, granulomas, we have exogenous and endogenous. Exogenous example, uh, silicon granuloma, DATO reaction, and endogenous gout and keratin granulomas. Now coming to necrobiotic granulomas, uh, which, which uh, lesions comes under necrobiotic or granuloma annular, annular elastolytic granulomas, necrobios hepatica, then rheumatoid nodule, palisaded neutrophilic dermatosis, necrobiotic xanthogranuloma. All these comes under necrobiotic granulomas. Now we'll uh, detail, we'll detailly see about the each type of granulomas. Now the first is non necrotizing granuloma. So under which we have sarcoidosis. So we have two forms of sarcoidosis, transient form and chronic persistent form. So transient form is associated with erythema nodosum, hyalur adenopathy, fever, polyarthritis, and iritis. And persistent only for a few months and resolve without sequel. And chronic persistent forms have 25% of cutaneous lesions. They have a red brown papules and flakes which is lupus perineum, where the lesions are seen in cheek and nose. And also they have annular lesions, occasionally lichenoid-like appearing, and they present very rarely as a subcutaneous nodule. So they are present as a circumscribed granuloma with little or no necrosis. Granulomas in the papillary region or a reticular dermis and even into the subcutis is usually seen. They don't have abundant dying cells and there's a latently scant ton of lymphocytes surrounding the epithelial cells. So they have shorn bodies that occur within the old giant cells. They are nothing but a laminated oval blue staining calcified bodies. Then also asteroid bodies also within the giant cells and they stain with uh, phosphotungstic acid hematoxin, that is PTAH, and the centers are red, brown, and the periphery are blue. So they are neither specific for sarcoidosis. So this is an histopathology microscopic view where it is a scanner view where you can see a well circumscribed modules of collection of epithelial cells. All these are well circumscribed modules with epithelial collection in the dermis and also it seen extending into the subcutaneous plane. And this is an hyper view showing giant cells and a granuloma here. So this is a giant cell. And this is a picture of an asteroid body. This is how an asteroid body look, which is situated inside a giant cell. And same here, Schwann bodies, which is situated inside the giant cell. This is a Schwann body. Now coming to tuberculoid uh, leprosy. So um, they are epithelioid granulomas that is indissociable from sarcoidosis. So granulomas may have an oblong configuration due to surrounding nerve and there will be a mild lymphocytic and plasma cellular infiltrate. There is no grain zone and organisms are rare or usually absent and presence of plasma cells, enlarged nerves and, and they are oblong. Granulomas may help to distinguish it from a cutaneous hypoidosis. So this is a microscopic picture of a tuberculoid uh, leprosy where you have a scattered oblong granulomas surrounded by lymphocytes and occasional plant muscles. So this is a nerve which is, has, I mean, uh, sorry, a granuloma which is an oblong type and it is surrounded by lymphocytes and plasma cells. And it is, and this is a picture of a well-formed granuloma surrounding the enlarged cutaneous nerve. And here you have nice giant cells. 
So this is a picture of a tuberculoid leprosy. Now, what is the difference between a tuberculoid leprosy and sarcoidosis? So in tuberculoid leprosy, it is an elliptical granuloma or an oblong granuloma, whereas in sarcoidosis, the granuloma is um, and in tuberculoid leprosy, granuloma is predominantly seen in the lower dermis, whereas in sarcoidosis, it is usually seen in the superficial and deep dermis. And uh, in tuberculoid leprosy, epidermis is atrophic. And uh, lymphocytes and plasma cells around the granuloma are seen in tuberculoid leprosy, where in sarcoidosis, it is a naked granuloma. It is not surrounded by lymphocytes and plasma cells. And also granulomas around the nerves and adnexia are seen in tuberculoid leprosy. Whereas um, in tuberculoid leprosy, lepra bacilli are very rarely seen in sarcoidosis, fibrin is often present. So these are the basic differences between tuberculoid leprosy and sarcoidosis. Now coming to necrotizing granuloma. So the first entity is primary cutaneous tuberculosis. So it's a primary infection of tuberculosis that occurs only rarely on the skin. So children and adults may acquire it following a minor trauma or a contact with infected material. It consists of asymptomatic crust covered ulcer referred to as tubercle chancre. And this is in microscopic picture where you can see a granuloma with necrosis here. Now coming to tuberculosis. Vercosa cutis. So tuberculosis vercosa cutis is also called as Vati tuberculosis. It is a Vati uh, plague-like form of pausy bacillary cutaneous tuberculosis resulting from inoculation of mycobacterium tuberculosis into the skin of a previously infected patient with moderate to high degree of immunity. So the histological picture includes hyperkeratosis, acanthosis, and beneath the epidermis, there is a collection of acute inflammatory infiltrate. Acute inflammatory infiltrate consists of neutrophils. Right? So the abscess formation may be observed in the upper dermis and in the mid dermis, there's tuberculoid granulomas with moderate amount of necrosis, which is usually present. So this is a hyper view where you can see hyperkeratosis and acanthosis. And in the mid dermis, you have the uh, um, granuloma formation, all these are giant cells with granuloma formation and focal areas of necrosis. Now coming to lupus vulgaris, it is a secondary reactivation of in previously infected patients with tuberculosis. So 90% of lesion is seen in head and the neck and they present as a red brown patches with deep seated nodules. They are, they present as a hapal jelly nodules. So tubercles seen in the dermis and caseous necrosis within the tubercles is slightly present or it may be absent. So many histiocytes and giant cells are seen and the tubercle bacilli are present in such small numbers and epidermis is usually atrophic or hyperplastic, follicular destruction sometimes present. So this is an again a hyper view showing nice granuloma, then we have the histiocytes, then the giant cells here. Next, coming to scrofuloderma. Scrofuloderma presents as a, as a direct extension into the skin of the underlying tuberculosis infection present most commonly from the lymph node or a bone. So histopathologically, the lesion usually exhibits non-specific changes such as abscess formation or ulceration. So if the uh, specimen is adequate, the tuberculoid granuloma will be considerable amount of necrosis in the deeper portion of the skin. Now coming to tuberculosis gumma, where uh, it's a hematogenous infection of skin from an internal lesion may result as a large dermal or subcutaneous nodule that is necrotic and ultimately ulcerates the epidermis. So histopathology, there's a caseous necrosis with rim of epithelioid cells and giant cells and acid fast bacilli are very scant. So this is a picture showing caseous necrosis with the rim of epithelioid cells and giant cells around it. So this is a picture of a tuberculosis tumor. Now coming to tuberculosis cutis orificialis. So tuberculosis cutis orificialis are shallow ulcers with a granulating base occurring singly or in 
numbers, small numbers. So they present near the mucosal orifices of patients with advanced internal tuberculosis. And histopathologically, there's ulcer surrounded by non-specific inflammatory infiltrate, tuberculoid granuloma with pronounced necrosis are found in the deep dermis. Now coming to tuberculates. Tuberculates are skin lesion in patients with tuberculosis infection. So usually uh, elsewhere in lymph nodes most common. So they stain for acid phase bacilli and culture for mycobacterium is usually negative. And there's a delayed hypersensitivity skin test for tuberculosis which shows positivity. And PCR technique, mycobacterial DNA has been identified in some lesions, and they present as a papular necrotic tuberculosis and lichen so, uh, sodium. Now coming to papular necrotic tuberculosis. So these papular necrotic lesions are ethymatous papules which are present in the limbs in the symmetrical distribution. So usually there'll be a leukocytoclastic vasculitis or lymphocytic vasculitis and presence of wedge-shaped area of necrosis. So this is a picture of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. And here in this picture, we'll be able to appreciate a wedge-shaped necrosis. And next coming to an uh, entity of tuberculosis that is lichen scrofulosodum, where it consists of an yellow or brown follicular uh, papules, which is 0 0.52 three millimeter in diameter, and it is usually present over the trunk. And they heal without scarring. There's a superficial uh, dermal granulomas are observed, usually in the density of the hair follicle and sweat glands, and caseous necrosis is usually absent. So around the hair follicle and the sweat gland, you can have a nice granuloma. Now coming to tertiary syphilis. So there are two types of skin lesion where you have superficial nodular lesion and gematous lesion. So superficial nodular lesions are red, brown, scaly nodules with serpentous advancing border, and gematous lesions are subcutaneous swelling with that ulcerate. So you must have granuloma with large areas of acellular necrosis, and there's a surrounding chronic inflammation includes the plasma cells. So this is a picture where you have necros a cellular necrosis and uh, surrounded by a chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate. And here, this is also a hyper view where you have a cellular necrosis here and it is surrounded by chronic inflammatory infiltrate. Now coming to foreign body granuloma. So as I told you, uh, there are exogenous and endogenous causes for foreign body granuloma as we discussed earlier. So, end of few endogenous uh, causes are keratin, hair shaft, then ruptured cyst content, released lipids, and UV crystals. Exogenous will be silica, graphite, then vegetable oil, zirconium, talcum powder, tattoo pigment, silicon, sutures. All these are examples for exogenous uh, foreign body material. So, we'll see the pictures where uh, this first picture, this uh, a uh, granulomatous response with a Swiss cheese appearance. So nice empty spaces, so which gives a Swiss cheese-like appearance. This is, a, this is an example for foreign body material. And here you can see nice silica, like foreign body material sitting inside the crystalline structures and they are doubly refractile when viewed under polarized microscope. So this is a granuloma and inside it, you have a silica-like foreign material. And this is again a ruptured epidermoid cyst and you can see nice um, foreign body reaction around it. And here it is a gout, where here also you can see nice foreign body reaction. And this is a picture of suture fragments with giant cells. All these are suture fragments. And uh, with, when it is viewed under a polarized light, it, the suture fragments give bifringents, and around it you have nice granulomas. Now coming to necrobiotic granulomas. So we have uh, seen the epithelial granuloma and foreign body type of granulomas. Now we are seeing necrobiotic granuloma. Now first entity is granuloma annular. Granuloma annular is an idiopathic palisaded granulomatous condition and it presents as a small firm asymptomatic papules that are flesh colored or pale red and are often grouped in an annular or circinate fashion. So commonly encountered on the arms, hands, legs, and feet, and there are different variants of granuloma annular. 
One is the generalized form where they will have too many papules and perforating glandular annular where it is an omnicated lesion and erythematous or patch glandular annular where it is erythematous patches and subcutaneous deemed glandular annular where you have a subcutaneous nodule. So the two histological pattern which is encountered, one is palisading pattern and interstitial pattern. So microscopic examination shows infiltrate of histiocytes and a perivascular uh, infiltrate of lymphocytes that is usually sparse. And there's increased mucin, which is a hallmark feature of granuloma annular. And there'll be degenerated collagen or, or small quantities of fibrin may also be present. And um, colloidal iron and alcine blue, these two are special stain which is used to highlight the mucin. So they show positivity for mucin, colloidal iron and alcine blue. And then histiocyte infiltrate seen in the full thickness of the dermis or in the middle and the upper dermis. And in subcutaneous granuloma annular may be histologically indistinguishable from rheumatoid nodule and appearance that can lead to the term called as pseudo rheumatoid nodule. So this is a um, microscopic picture of a palisading type where you have palisading histiocytes here and surrounded by mucin in the upper dermis here. And this is the uh, picture of an interstitial pattern of granuloma annular where you exhibit the histiocytes in between the collagen bundles. All these are collagen bundles. And in between there, you have the histiocytes and there's also perivascular lymphocytic infiltration. So uh, this is a picture of a deep granuloma annular where you have a well-circumscribed subcutaneous nodule showing palisading histiocytes and by mucin and fibrinoid material. And this is in hyper view where you have histiocytes which are palisading around, surrounded by mucin and you have the fibrinoid material. So this is the palisading histiocytes. Next entity is annular elastolytic granuloma. So the lesion is seen in the sun exposed uh, skin, face, neck, dorsum of hand, uh, forearm, and arm, and it's also named as acnic granuloma. So the best place to take biopsy at the periphery of the lesion to include the central area, the annular ring, and the perilational skin. Histology reveals there's a central area, annular ring, and perilational zone. So we'll see what all are seen in the each area. In central area, you have a decreased elastic fiber with normal or thickened collagen. In the annular ring, it contains numerous histiocytes and foreign body type of chances, often containing phagocytosed elastic fibers. Asteroids body can also be present. In perilational zone, they contain induced elastotic material and mucin is usually absent. So the special stain uh, to elicit is Verhoff van Jason stain for elastic fiber, where you can find a contrast in E3 zones. So this is a normal uh, picture where you have the central zone where there is a loss of elastic fiber. Then uh, you have the periphery zone where it's a mucin. And this is a hyper view. This is a stain with Verhoff van Jason where you have where you have the uh, contrast between uh, the central zone, the perilational zone, and the annular ring. So as I told you, in central area, there will be a loss of elastic fiber with normal and thickened collagen. In the annular ring, there's numerous histiocytes and foreign body type of giant cells. And in perilational zone, they contain increased elastotic material. So here, as you see, there's a loss of elastic material where you have thickened collagen bundles and you have uh, increased elastotic material here. Then you have increased histiocytic collection and giant cells. Necrobiosis lipodica. So necrobiosis lipodica is an idiopathic disorder typified by indurated plaques of the shin with the central atrophy and telangiectasia. So there's a yellow brown in the center and they are purple at the periphery. And 67% of patient presents with overt diabetes. So microscopically, there's a focus of necrobiosis. Necrobiosis is nothing but necrosis. So seen in the mid reticular dermis and foci of collagen degeneration may extend into the subcutaneous fibrous sector. There's a pale staining collagen surrounded by palisade of histiocytes 
multinucleated giant cells and few cases, cases shows dense lymphoplasma cell infiltrate with germinal center. There is also endothelial cell swelling which is encountered. Then vascular wall thickening which is nothing but a microangiopathy and histiocytes contain lipid in well developed lesion. So this is a picture of microbiosis, mucolica, where you have nice mucosis here, the nice collection of inflammatory infiltrate. Now coming to dermatoid nodule. Dermatoid nodules are uh, deep-seated firm masses that occur in patients with dermatoid arthritis. They are subcutaneous uh, but may extend into the mid reticular dermis, usually overlying the joints on fingers. So as we told you, we have already seen our pseudo rheumatoid nodules. So that these are the nodules in the subcutis that mimic rheumatoid nodules, but histologically, but in the absence of pain of joint pain, rheumatoid arthritis or systemic lupus erythematosus. So microscopically, uh, we have rheumatoid nodules that occur in the subcutis and, subcutis and deep dermis. So they exhibit fibrinoid gene degradation of the collagen, the stains homogeneously red. Then there are nuclear fragments and basophilic materials racially present, and mucin is minimal or absent. And there's a focus of degenerative changes are surrounded by histiocytes in the uh, which are palisading, and there's a foreign body type of giant cell which is usually present. And this is a picture of a picture where you have a massive microbiosis with adjacent scarring and then lymphocytic infiltrate. And this is also a microbiotic trunk tissue surrounded by well-developed histiocytes. All these are palisadic histiocytes and here you have the microbiotic trunk tissue. Now next coming to palisadic, neutrophilic and granulomatous dermatitis. There's an entity within it, it called as interstitial granulomatous dermatitis. So it has a hurly lesion resembling mucocytoplastic vasculitis and fully developed lesion with granuloma annulaire like appearance but associated with prominent neutrophils. So you have fibrosing necrobiosis, fibro, fibrosing necrobiosis lipolica like final stage which is usually present. So this is a microscopic picture where you have thickened and degenerated collagen bundles, fibrin and mucin around it. Now coming to granuloma multiforme, they are small, flesh-colored, indurated, pruritic papilla nodules, which is 1 to 8 millimeter in diameter and it usually raises about 1 to 3 millimeter above the skin surface, so which extends peripherally and compiles to form annular lesions and plagues. So microscopically, there is abnormal uh, collagen fiber interspersed with unaffected ones and associated with histiocytic infiltration. So you can see nice abnormal collagen fibers interspersed within it and you have nice histiocytic infiltrate collection. Next coming to necrobiotic xanthogranuloma. They are large indurated plates with atrophy, telangiectasia and ulceration in the trunk. So the papules and nodules on the face, especially in the periorbital region and usually it is uh, associated with IgG, no uh, clonal gammopathy. And microscopically, we have the intersecting bands of granulomatous inflammation throughout the dermis and subcutis. And there's a bands of hyaline microbiosis. Then foam cells, all these are foam cells. Foam cells, the inflammatory cells, and abundant giant cells, which is usually tutan type of giant cells, and cholesterol clefts. All these are cholesterol clefts. These are giant cells, and here we have the foam cells, which is usually seen in microbiotic xanthogranuloma. Now this fungal infection or also, also causes granulomatous inflammation. So the special stains which are used are gomeri, methylene, uh, methylamine silver, then periodic acid shift, glimlase fungus, uh, then GMS. GMS is nothing but glomeri, methylamine silver with HNE as a counter stain. So these are the special stain which is used to identify fungus. So these are the special stain which is used to identify fungus. And here also we have nine spine like fungal elements sitting inside it. So all these also causes granulomatous inflammation. Now coming to non-granulomatous granuloma, which is nothing but a misnomer. So the name has granuloma, but the lesion doesn't elicit any granulomas. 
So, for example, granuloma uh, facial, which resembles a leukocytoplastic vasculitis. And then eosinophilic granuloma, where there's only a lanthan cell histiocytosis, which is associated. And then lethal midline granuloma is nothing but a T cell lymphoma. Then uh, pyogenic granuloma is nothing but a lobular capillary hemangioma. Then granuloma gluteal infantum, which is nothing but a spongiotic dermatitis. So all these are misnomer and they are non granulomatous granuloma. Now we'll see what are the types of giant cells. So they are, they are categorized as resorptive giant cells, inflammatory giant cells, viral giant cells, and tumor giant cells. It is, this is only for uh, completion sake, I'll just tell you. So coming to resorptive giant cells, they are osteoclast, then chondroclast, then teuton giant cells, synthesis tropoplast, which are seen in placenta, then foreign body type of giant cells. Inflammatory giant cells are nanhen type of giant cells and foreign body type of giant cells and viral giant cells, which is vatan filinki giant cells, then adenovirus giant cells, herpetic giant cells, and giant cells seen in HIV infections. Then we have a wide category like tumor giant cells. We'll see a picture of each one of it, few examples. Now, this is an osteoclast type of giant cells, which is a resorption bay. Then we have the chondrocyte here. This is a chondrocytic giant cells. Then this is a teuton type of giant cells. Then this is a foreign body type of giant cells, which is haphazardly arranged cells. Then um, this is a lanthan type of giant cells, which you usually see in tuberculosis. It is also shaped or necklace, necklace shaped or collar pattern. So you can call it with any name. So it is lanthan type of giant cells. Then this is Fathen Findicle giant cells. Sorry. Then we have the syncytio type of giant cells here in placenta. Then adenovirus giant cells. Then uh, this is in herpetic giant cells. And there's a special stain called Zansmuir, which is prepared to look for herpetic giant cells. Then we have uh, giant cells in HIV infection patient and these are the tumor giant cells which is seen in malignancy or carcinoma. Thank you so much. We'll end the session.